L is for the way you look at me. O is for the only one I see. V is very, very. E is even more than anyone you adore can love. Come on, I know you all know that song. I know you all know that song. Amen, amen, amen. We're in this message series titled, What's Love Got to Do With It? We're talking about God's love, and obviously by that video, the intro video, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 13, amen, a popular scripture talking about love. So my question is this, how many of you know, how many of you believe that it's easy to fall in love? Uh, let's just say you meet someone, uh, you like the way they look, you like the way they dress, um, um, they make you laugh, you guys have some things in common, you, you, you start to talk and, and converse and uh, you enjoy what this person and how this person makes you feel, um, slowly but surely you start to fall in love. Um, it, it's, it's easy. It's, it's, it's easily, we can fall in love easy, but how many of you know that it's easier to fall out of love? Right? It's easy to, to meet that person that makes you feel good, that says all the right things. How you doing? Hot dog. Right? You, you meet somebody who, who says these things and just makes you feel good, and you're like, wow, yeah, I like this person. And you start to fall for this person. But then it's easier to fall out of love. Why? Because then you start to see true colors. You start to see things that they didn't do at the beginning of the relationship. They start to say some things or they start, um, you didn't know that they used the restroom with the door open. And you, you, you notice these things and you start to, the, the love that you once felt starts to fade away. And it's like, ah, I'm no longer in love. I'm just tolerating. Right? Uh, um, it's easy to fall in love, but easier to fall out of love. And so, the question tonight and the title of this message is still in love. The question is, how can we still be in love? How can I still remain in love? How can I still love even when that person wrongs me? Can I still love when the world spits in my face? Can I still love when my spouse disrespects me? Can I still love when that person cuts me off on the freeway? Can I still love when that person has 16 items in the 15 items or less line at Walmart, right? The question is, can I still love? You see, we, can, we, we talk about love and, and, and what it does for our, our lives and for our hearts. It makes us feel good. But as soon as someone wrongs us or does something that we don't like, do we start rolling the love back? We start to take our love back and say, hmm, uh, maybe you're not deserving of my love. It's a real question. It's a real issue that we face. Amen? Amen. So that's the question that we're going to focus on tonight is how can we still be in love? Because it's, it's an issue. People say, okay, well, what does love have to do with it? That message series. What does love have? If you think about it, love has everything to do with what we do as, as believers. Right? Uh, God says to, to love God and to love everyone else. Uh, I think love is a pretty, pretty important thing to have. And he says to love your neighbor. I think love is a pretty important thing to have. He says um, um, faith, hope, and love will last forever, but the greatest of these is love. So I'm pretty, I, I think love is an important thing to have and to understand. So that's what we're going to dive in tonight, and we're going to stay in the, the, the passage of 1 Corinthians 13, how they talk about love and what God wants to teach us on how we can remain in love, because it's easy to fall out. As you want, one thing that God has taught me recently um, is this, um, that we have to fall back every day in order to avoid falling out forever, right? So we have to constantly fall back every day to avoid falling out forever, so it's a, a consistency thing that we have to do daily in order to avoid falling out forever. So God has taught me this, and through this study and through this message, God has taught me three things that he wants to teach us tonight on how we can remain in love and how we can still love even though we get wronged, even though that person bumps into me. We can still love. The power of love breaks chains and breaks shackles. 
You see, the world will stereotype believers as hypocrites. The world will stereotype us, and our job as believers is to prove those stereotypes wrong. Right? They'll say, oh, that person just loves other Christians. That person just loves the people that go to church. That person just loves those who love them back. But how about we be the light in the world and love on people regardless? How about we be the change in the world to love on people even when they wrong us? How about we be that love? And that's why we're talking about how can I still love even though they did me wrong? So that's going to be the focus of tonight's message. Are you with me, New Hope? Are you with me? We have to still be in love with the world, with our coworkers, with our friends, with our family, with our spouses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 has a long list that they talk about love. But tonight, what I want to do is I want to focus on one scripture. One scripture, three points. God is going to use this one scripture, and it's found at the top of your notes. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and it says this, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Now, there's many other things that God talks about in this passage, but you're going to have to stay tuned. You're going to have to come back next Wednesday and the Wednesday after. Tonight, we're just going to focus on this one scripture, and we're going to use this scripture to teach us how to remain in love, how to still be in love, how to still love regardless of what they do to us or how they act to us. So love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It's not boastful, and it's not proud. The question is, well, what love do we believe in? You see, uh, many of us have different perceptions of love and what love is. Maybe we've we've learned about love through watching um, romantic comedies. Maybe we've watched some some love love movies, uh, uh, like the the, the Notebook or whatever it's called. I, (laughs) yeah, I'm acting like I don't know. I watched it. (laughs) I watched it. Right? Um, um, so, so they have these movies that, that, that are about love and falling in love and all these things. Or maybe you've learned about love through a novel or, or something you've read. Right? Maybe you've learned about love through life experiences. But we all have different perspectives of what love is. But see, 1 Corinthians 13, God brings us to what real love is. You see, we can love, but we can't have the real love of God. And I'm going to explain the difference. I'm going to explain the difference. You see, I can just love somebody, but this is what I've learned in your bullet point. Real love comes with a sacrifice. Real love comes with a sacrifice. Can I just get up all in your business? If there is no sacrifice... And chances are it's not real love. Come on. If there is no sacrifice, then chances are it's not real love. If something is not dying, if something is not given up for sacrifice, then it's not real love. Hmm. I'm gonna let that I'm gonna let that marinate for a little bit. You see, we can love. Uh, The Bible teaches us, if someone strikes your cheek, to give your other cheek. Now, I've always wondered, what does that mean? What is God teaching us in that scripture? He even says, if someone asks for your shirt, give them the coat off your back. Uh, There's another scripture where it says, if the Roman soldier asks you to carry his armor for one mile, you take it two miles. And I've always thought, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me? You see, the first mile is just love. But it's that second mile is where real love comes. You see, that first smack on the cheek, that's just love. You smack me on the cheek, I let you walk away. That's love. But here's, here's my sacrifice. Forgive me, brother. Just let it all out on me. Um, um, here's my shirt, but here's my coat, too. There's a sacrifice to it. You see, God says, the, the word of God is in John 3, 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave. You see, real love comes with a sacrifice. And we're talking about marriages, we're talking about relationships, we're talking about friendships, we're talking about all these things. If there is no sacrifice in these areas, then there is no real love. You see, 
people have this perspective or a perception of what the love is or what they think love is. And truly, it's been deteriorating marriages. Right? We want, we want the love that we see in the movies. We want the love that we read about in novels. We want that kind of love. We want all the fancy and glam. But see, real love sometimes has its ugly moments. You see, when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, do you think it was a pretty sight? Do you think it was a nice sight to see? No, real love comes with a sacrifice. There's going to be some ugly moments. And that's what we're going to learn about this real love tonight. How love is patient, love is kind. You see, if there is no sacrifice, then the marriage will deteriorate. What am I talking about? I mean, I've been learning about a marriage for the past year and a half. Now, many of you are like, man, that's nothing, Austin. You're still in a year and a half. Oh, I've learned. I've learned a lot so far. Let me, let me tell you. Let me tell you, right? Uh, um, don't, don't let the year and a half fool you. Um, God, 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 has, God has strengthened my marriage through some things. Um, but we've learned, we've learned that if there was no sacrifice, if I don't sacrifice my wants, my desires for my wife to be happy, then the marriage falls apart. So we have to learn that, that we have to sacrifice something. So real love comes with a sacrifice. And these three things that God taught me is three practical things that we can do right now in our lives. It's not something you have to work towards, something that you have to sign up and take a class for. These are three things that I'm going to give you tonight that we can do right now in our lives to still love. To still love. Are you with me? Are you with me? Now, number one. To still remain in love, number one, leave room for mistakes. Leave room for mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Now, if you're sitting here and you're saying, no, my spouse is perfect. He don't mess up. You're living in a fairy tale. I'm just going to tell you straight up. You're living in a fairy tale. Uh, if you think, oh, um, uh, my pastor is perfect. My pastor does no wrong. You're living in a fairy tale. No one's perfect. And that's why it's important that we leave room for mistakes. That sometimes people are going to make mistakes. People may say something that they don't mean. But that doesn't mean that our love turns away from them. We have to leave room for these mistakes. And I love how the Bible teaches it here in Colossians 3.13. It says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. And it says, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Make an allowance for each other's faults. Now, I really wanted to understand the word allowance and what it really meant, because I just thought it was money that I got for doing my chores. Um, Well, God taught me this. He said that allowance, it's the amount of something that is permitted. Allowance is the amount of something that is permitted, especially within a set of regulations or a specific purpose. Right? That's allowance. uh, Permitted. So I looked at what permitted means, and it says this. It means to give authorization or consent to someone to do something. So when we give an allowance, we give consent to someone, what we're doing is we're giving, we're extending grace. We're saying, even though you make a mistake, I'm giving you an allowance, I'm giving you this grace. Even though you hurt me, even though you do me wrong, even though you backstab or you backbite or you talk about me behind my back, I'm going to give an allowance of grace. I'm extending God's grace. That's the love of God. We have to make room for mistakes because people will do us wrong in this world. But that does not mean that we turn away from them. I love this past Sunday, Pastor Bam talked about, uh, I'm not, stop ignoring the issues of the world and the, the lovelessness, that we need to start addressing these issues. So just because someone does you wrong, don't say, okay, I'm done with you. I'm just going to be a Christian here. I'm not going to talk to you. I'll be good over here. No, no. We have to go and show that love to that person. Do you know that your love can break that chain? The love that you show to that person, that grace that you extend to that person can free that person from that bondage of anger, that bondage of just being mean to people. Right? It's your love that can break those chains. So we have to make that allowance, give that consent, say, hey, I'm extending grace to you. We're making that allowance with people because people will make mistakes. We have to leave room for mistakes. 
And I love in Proverbs 17, 9, it says, Love prospers, love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Do you know it, that offense is, is the number one thing that, that it breaks friendships? Offense is the number one thing that divides marriages, right? Things that happen, people that hold on to these things, it it breaks friends, it breaks marriages, it breaks a relationship between the people and the church because we didn't leave room for mistakes. We have to understand that nobody's perfect. If you're looking for a perfect pastor, you're going to keep looking for the rest of your life. If you're looking for a perfect leader, you're you're going to be looking for the rest of your life. If you're looking for the perfect boss, you're going to be looking for the rest of your life. No one is perfect. That's why we have to extend grace and make room for mistakes. Because people will fall short. God is the only perfect one that will never fail us. God, Jesus was the only perfect one that will never fail us. And that's why we rely on him, solely on him. We don't anchor our joy in our boss. We don't anchor our joy in our pastor. We don't anchor our joy in our spouse. No, I anchor my joy in Jesus. Right, but we have to make an allowance. We have to make room for these mistakes because they will happen. Now, I'm not saying this to discourage you, but I'm saying this to open your eyes because no one is perfect. So these mistakes, they're bound to happen. So we have to make that allowance for people. Amen? Um, um, my son, he's about 10 months old, a little over 10 months. And one thing that I've learned, um, uh, we've been learning recently is, is um, he's been walking so we've been trying to um, cover corners, and we've been, I mean, our house looks like a fort. I mean, we have, like, pillows everywhere. We have blankets covering all these things because my son is starting to walk. So well, my wife and I will we'll sit about, uh, like, maybe 10, I would say 10 feet apart, and we have my son walk between us with the, his little toy. And we'd make him walk back and forth, just kind of exercise his legs. And what we've noticed is that the more he does it, the more he, he, he feels um, the, the, the confidence in his legs to walk. So there's times where he'll let go and he'll start to walk on his own. You see, but what I've noticed is that when he falls, nobody makes a big deal about it. God is the same way with us. Right? He makes room for mistakes because he knows that we're going to fall. There's going to be times that we're going to stumble. But see, God rejoices in the steps that we take and not the falls that we make. Right? The same with my son. I never say, oh, you fell. I, I give up on you. You, you, you. you took a step and you fell. You're done. You're, I'm, I'm done with you. Out of my house. I don't say that about my son. No, we say, son, get back up. Let's do it again. You almost did it. We rejoice in those moments. What am I doing? I'm making room for mistakes. People are going to fall. People are going to stumble. But when they fall, don't just point out their flaw. You see, I've learned that um, we should never look at people as a lost cause, but the cause for our ministry. Right? When people fall, people make mistakes. Don't just turn away and walk away and give up on them. No, we still continue to extend love, to extend grace. We still love on these people. But Austin, this guy's been doing it to me over and over. Hey, it's okay to love from afar, but still love on them. This, per- this person has been poisoned to my life. It's okay to love from afar, but love on them. See, the thing that we do most of the time is we, we turn and we walk away from that person and just say, you know what? You're not worth my love. Could you imagine if God did that to us? Could you imagine if God says, you know what? You're not worth my time. But no, God's love is relentless after us. No matter how many times we fall, no matter how many times we go astray, go drift, God welcomes us with arms wide open. He makes room for mistakes. So we have to understand that we have to leave those rooms so that when people do make mistakes, our extended extension of grace is what covers them. Just like my son, when he falls down, I don't blame him. I don't, I don't shout at him. I don't say, you, you messed up. You, you stupid. You, 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 don't, you don't have nothing um, that's going to make me happy. I, I don't say these things to my son. No, no. I say, Let, son, let's get up. Let's do it again. Let's try again. Right? It's the same way, we, the same love that we should have with other people. If my, if, if my wife does something, I'm not going to beat her down with my words. No, we uplift. We say, hey, hey, let's, let's try it again. I, I, I applaud that you were trying. I applaud that you took a step. You fell. Hey, get back up. Right? We have to make room for mistakes. Amen? So understand that. Understand we have to give an allowance for one another. Leave room for mistakes. And number two, write this down in your notes. Don't let insecurity put out the fire. You see, we covered the first part of the, the, the scripture, love is patient, love is kind. 
uh, with leaving room for mistake. But this is the part of the, the scripture where, where we talk about jealousy. We talk about jealousy. Now, people might think, hey, jealousy is not a big deal. Envy is not a big deal. Well, let's take a look at the Bible and see what uh, jealousy has done. Um, I don't think jealousy was a, was a, I think jealousy was a huge deal when it came to Cain and Abel. Right? I think envy was a big deal when it came to Joseph and his brothers. Um, I think envy was a big deal when Jesus was betrayed and put on the cross. So I think envy is a big deal. And what I've learned is that it's either life or death. It's one or the other. There's no in between. So if we don't have the fruits of the spirit, then we're, active, we're acting in the fruits of the flesh. So if we have jealousy, then we don't have the fruits of the spirit. And I love that the scripture starts off with what love is, and it tells us what love isn't. Because God doesn't leave us hanging. He teaches us. This is what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Leave room for mistakes. But when it comes to jealousy, don't let insecurity put out the fire. Don't let insecurity put out the fire. You see, jealousy will break marriages, will break friendships, will break relationships. Envy is not a good thing to have in our hearts. And that's why God put that at, in the scripture at the very beginning. He tells us what it's not. It's not envy. It's not jealous. And so I found in Proverbs 14.30, it says this, that a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. But jealousy is like a cancer in the bones. Jealousy is like cancer to the bones. I remember a pastor once taught me that um, holding on to a fence is like drinking the poison and hoping the other person dies. And I truly believe that jealousy is the same way. That jealousy is like drinking the poison, hoping someone else dies, hoping that other person dies. Jealousy rots the bones. It brings a cancer to the bones. But a peaceful heart. You see, it's interesting that it talks about peace and then it talks about jealousy. Peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Jealousy isn't. So it's life or death. Are you going to have a peaceful heart when it comes to a situation where people uh, have things that you want or have things that, that, that uh, or people are promoted and your love is like, ah, I don't love that guy. He got, he got the job I wanted. Right? We start to think of those things and we start to re- um, pull back our love and say, no, you don't deserve my love. No, don't let insecurity uh, um, uh, put out the fire in our lives. Amen. James 3.16 says, forever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. It's life or death. You can either choose peace, the fruits of the Spirit, or you could choose jealousy. The, that's not even the fruits of the Spirit. Jealousy will cause us to be insecure. Um, recently, uh, I'm going to show you guys a story. Be transparent. Um, my wife and I, we went to my brother's graduation, and um, uh, we had an awesome time. And I remember um, leaving the graduation, we were walking up the stairs to the garage, um, and I remember uh, these two gentlemen walking down the stairs. Don't think I'm weird. Don't think I'm weird. Let me finish the story. Um, these two gentlemen walked down the stairs, and um, I- I'm, I'm the type of person that likes to give credit where credit is due. Um, these were... Um, very well put together gentlemen. I'll just put it like that. They were, they were very well put together, uh, um, very well groomed gentlemen. Um, they were probably, they looked like guys that could be cast in like CSI Miami, right? These were, these were a very, very put together, well groomed gentlemen. And I'm walking up the stairs and I see them. I'm like, these guys look like movie stars. Wow. And I remember walking and my wife's behind me. Right, she's carrying my son, she's behind me, and we're walking up the stairs, and the first thing came to mind was like, these guys look like they could be in CSI. And I walk, and I turn to my wife, I said, hey, those are good-looking guys. Don't think I'm weird. I give credit where credit is due. I said, hey, those guys are well put together. You see, what I've learned is that the more that I know my wife, the more I'm secure in our love. You see, I didn't have to be jealous. I didn't have to worry. I didn't have to like, oh, look, I hope she doesn't talk to them. I hope they don't talk to her. 
I didn't have to have that insecurity. Why? Because I know my wife. I know that my wife loves me. I know that my wife wouldn't cheat on me. I know that my wife would never uh, talk to someone behind my back. I know my wife. You know, it's the same thing with God. Sometimes we get insecure because we don't know who he is and his promises in our lives. Sometimes we get insecure and we don't know who God calls us to be. Right? The insecurity will blur and put out the fire in our lives. And we say, God, I, I don't think I can do it. Do you know who God is? God used Moses and he can't even speak. God used David and he was a little boy. Right? And we start, we start to question God's capabilities. We start to question and that fire in us, that love in us for other people, right? That love, that envy, uh, we start to be insecure. And that's why love doesn't, is not jealous. It doesn't envy. So our love, our security should always be in Christ. Our security should always be because we know who we are. We know who we are in Christ Jesus. That insecurity will put out the fire. So the more you know who God is, the more you know uh, the love of God. Right? You don't have to be insecure. You don't have to worry about these things. You don't have to worry about uh, people uh, b- talking behind your back. You don't have to worry about that. The more you know who God is, the more you are secure in him. Amen? Amen. So that's what I've learned. I've learned with, the, with, with these two gentlemen. I said, man, those guys, well, they could be on TV. But n- it never did cross my mind to be jealous. It never crossed my mind to be envious. Uh, it was just, I just cracked a joke with my wife. But I truly believe that it was God teaching me that it's because you love your wife, because you know that your wife loves you. And the same thing with the Word of God. The more that we know God, and the more that God uh, enters into our hearts and lives in us, the more we're secure in who He is. We're secure in His characteristic. We're secure. We know who God is and what He's capable of doing in our lives. So love is not jealous. Don't be jealous. Don't be insecure, because insecure will put out that fire. And we need to be careful with that. Many times, um, that, that envy, it could hurt us. When we hold on to that envy, when we hold on to that jealousy, it'll hurt us and it'll hurt our love for people. When someone gets promotion, I take my love. I don't love my boss. He, he, he promoted that person. He should have promoted me. Right? The same thing with Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's brothers, they, they envied, je- they were jealous. They were like, man, why does my dad love Joseph so much? They sold him into slavery. You see how envy can break up families? Envy can break up marriages. Envy can break up friendships. So we have to be careful that we're not holding on to the envy. We're not holding on to these things, hoping that someone else gets hurt. We have to make sure that the insecurity in our lives doesn't put out the fire. Trust in God. Trust in the love that he has given you. When it comes to marriage, trust your spouse. I knew a guy who wouldn't let his wife have a Facebook because he was afraid that she would go talk to other people. And it's interesting. It's interesting. I'm like, man, you've been married for so long and you still can't trust. It's almost like you guys are still in high school. And I think about it. I said, man, are we still acting in, in childish ways? Are we still acting like children? Not trusting one another? But love is not jealous. Love is not envious. We have to love people regardless. Amen? Amen, amen. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. All right, all right. Number three, number three. Go back to the cross. How do you remain still in love? Go back to the cross. So that last part, the last portion of the scripture is love is not boastful and love is not proud. And what I've learned is this, sometimes we love to receive recognition. Sometimes we love to receive applause. What do I mean? Uh, Well, God says to love your neighbor, to love everyone. And unfortunately, I've seen um, in many cases um, people who would love on um, the less fortunate but expecting recognition back. Now, that's not real love because there's no sacrifice. I've seen uh, people who um, uh, people ask for um, uh, change or some money. And I've seen people um, uh, selfie as I drop these coins in this person's bucket. People seek recognition. They seek, they want people to applaud them for what they're doing, but that's not real love. See, love is not boastful. 
We don't seek recognition. We do it all for the glory of God. So it's, it's not about me. It's not about, it's not about what I'm doing. It's what about God's doing through me. It has nothing to do with me. And we should never seek recognition when doing things. And this is what I've learned in the Bible. And the scripture tells it right here in Matthew 6, 3 to 4. It says, but when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. Selfie, let me put these uh, coins in your, your cup. I want people to know that I'm doing a good deed. That's not real love. You see, the sacrifice is putting away your self-recognition. The sacrifice is giving up. I don't want to be acknowledged. I laid on my life. You see, one thing that I learned about the Bible, it's instructions to kill the flesh. Instructions to kill the flesh. So when you be patient and you be kind, what you're doing is you're killing the flesh saying, hey, don't get angry with this person. Don't, be, don't get angry. Extend grace. Right? And when we uh, don't let insecurities put out the fire, what we're doing is we're putting away the jealousy. We're putting away that envy spirit. We're putting it away. We're saying, God, I died to self, Lord, and I trust in you. The same thing with the self-recognition. We have to die to it and say, no, no, I don't want the glory, God. The glory belongs to you. You see, when, when um, Peter, Peter he, healed, he healed this crippled man. And everybody was like, ooh, look at you. He, Peter just healed this guy. Peter, Peter used that opportunity to address the crowd. And he said, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. It was not me who did it, but it was the God who's in me that did it. He said he redirected their focus and their attention to who the true source is. And that's how we should always be when it comes to giving to people. Love is not boastful. We don't walk around puffed up and say, hey, I gave this much to this person. Hey, I went, I, I fed the homeless. I went all, all, all year last year. Never missed a weekend. Hey, I, I went and I spent some time at, at the, the children's hospital. Hey, that's good. If you're doing it, God bless you. But don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't seek self-recognition. Don't seek an applause from man. Just do it in private. Let God get the glory. Say, God, use me to reach these people. Don't use me to get self-recognition so people can see me on the big screen. It should never be about that. That's not what real love is. Real love comes with the sacrifice. Are you saying I could be on the news if I go to, if I go to the feed the homeless? The news is going to be there? Can I be on TV? I, I, I don't want the glory, God. I, I, give, it, I give it to you, Father. I, I don't want the glory, Father God. Right? It, it, it's, it's not seeking that self-recognition, not seeking the applause of man. So we can't let, the, let, let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. Amen? Now you're asking, now what does it mean to go back to the cross? What does that have to do with anything we're, we're saying? What I'm saying is go back to where the glory belongs. See, many times we forget that the glory belongs to Jesus. Many times we get so caught up in doing the work of God that we start to take the glory. Many times people will come and say, how's Great, great worship. I always have to catch my flesh and say, oh, no, glory to God. Because if not, I let the flesh take over and say, thank you. It was me up there singing. It was me up there playing the guitar. I have to always catch my flesh and say, no, 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 no. This, this, is, this is God. This is God using me. I always have to catch my flesh. Love is not boastful. So let's not be boastful or proud. You see, in boastful and in being proud, what it's rooted in, it's rooted in pride. It's rooted in pride. It's about I, 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 I. How many of you know that the Bible is not about I, 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 I? No, the Bible is about God, 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 God. It's about Jesus. It's about his people. It says love God and love others. There's nothing that says love God, love yourself, then love others. No, it's love God, love others. It has nothing to do with me. So we can't be prideful. Because what happens? Pride comes before destruction. Comes before the fall. We have to make sure that we're not trying to boast and walk around puffed up. So we have to go back to the cross. Go back to who's originally the one who gets the glory. Remember who did it on the cross. Remember who walked to Calvary. Remember and go back to the cross. That will help us remain still in love. I love it. In, in Matthew 23, 12, this was a gut check for me. It says, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who um, humbles himself will be exalted. Don't be prideful. If you don't remember the brokenness, then God will remind you. Many times um, 
in marriages or in my marriage, I remember my wife and I, um, there's times where we'd fight. And there's times we'd be like, I'm right. I'm right, you're wrong. We become prideful. But what I have to do is I always have to take it back to the cross. See, what the cross reminds me of is that broken time, that broken moment that I received Christ, that broken moment where God picked me up. That's what the cross reminds me of. And when it comes to my marriage, there's times where me and my wife will fight and will argue, and I always have to take it back to my wedding day. Have you ever seen someone in a wedding picture like rolling their eyes like, yeah, I hate this person. No, you never see that. In a wedding picture, you see smiles ear to ear. Why? Because they're happy. It's their happiest day of their life. They, they, they married their soulmate. They married the person that God put in their life. They're happy. Sometimes we've got to go back to the cross. Sometimes I, when, when I'm, I'm saying, I'm right, you're wrong. I remember how, how my wife looked walking down the aisle. And it brings me back to, to that soft heart. Like, man, I'm, I'm so blessed. I'm so thankful for you. Forgive me for what I said. Forgive me for what I did. And that's how you stay in love. That's how you remain in love, is when you go back to the cross. The same thing with your love for the ministry. With your love for ministry, your love for being a parent, your love for being a friend or a brother to somebody, maybe that's your ministry. Sometimes the ministry can become monotonous. You say, I've been doing this. I've been coming to church. I've been uh, serving Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday. I've been doing it over and over again. It's been monotonous. But God is saying, take it back to the cross. Remember that moment when you were broken. I picked you up. See, for me, and I'm going to be transparent with you, there's times where I come and I say, man, I've been coming to, I've been, I come Tuesday practices, and then we, we do worship on Wednesday. We do worship on Sunday. And they, I have those seasons where the enemy will work in my heart and say, Austin, you've been doing this over and over, man. Take a break. Walk away from the church. But it's in those moments where I say, no, no, no I'm, I'm going back to the cross And I remember when I was broken, when I was lost, and I had nobody. I had no friends. I had no one to talk to. And the only person that talked to me was the Word of God. The only one that could talk to me was the Word of God. When I picked up that Bible and I started to read the Word of God, He talked to me through His Word. And it's going back to the cross that makes me fall back in love with the ministry. Fall back in love with what I'm called to do. Fall back in love with what I'm I'm called and my purpose in life. To worship Him. So I encourage you, if you feel drained, if you're feeling... Man, I've been doing this. It's monotonous. My wife and I, we, we've, been, we've been fighting. My spouse, my husband and I, we've been fighting over and over. Go back to the wedding day. Go back to when you first fell in love. See, we're called the bride of Christ. Go back when you, God first called you, when God called you out of the darkness. Those are the moments that break away the calluses on our hearts. And we think we, we, the, the calluses and the hurts, the pains that we hold on to, that we think is good for us. God says, no, no, give me all that. Go back to when you were a baby Christian, when you you first fell in love with me. How you were so on fire to read the word of God. You were so on fire to to, to love and to extend worship to me. It's in those moments we have to go back to the cross. So whenever you feel uh, um, uh, like you're you're drained or or things are going not going your way, I encourage you, even if you write it down in your journals, you write it down in your your, uh, notebooks, write down the victories that God's done in your life. Many times you'll read it and you'll say, man, I should have been dead there. But God, you, you, you kept me. You were you re- you relentless after me. You kept chasing me. And it's those moments you say, man, thank you, God. Now my fire, my love is, is back. I'm still in love with you. Never be boastful. Never be prideful. Because you think you got it all together. If you don't remember the brokenness, God will remind you what the brokenness feels like. So we have to always go back to when we first fell in love with God. And I tell you this. You do these things. You make room for mistakes. You don't allow the insecurities to put out the fire. And you continually, every day, going back to the cross, you will remain in love with your spouse, with your marriage, with your your ministry, with your friends, with your family, and that fire will never die. I challenge you, continue to love and remain in love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. (laughs) 